Good evening once again and welcome back to our study of Christian theology. We are currently um, looking at the doctrine of the Holy Spirit or pneumatology. In tonight's study of pneumatology, we will continue to look at the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life and ministry of Christ. Last week we saw that the ministry of the Holy Spirit um, was at work in the miraculous conception of Christ in the virgin womb of Mary. That's what we considered last time. And to this we want to add tonight that we can also be sure that the Holy Spirit was with Christ throughout his childhood. Because Luke chapter 2 verse 52 tells us that Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. And in that same chapter, Luke records that at the age of 12, Jesus was already about his father's business, or in his father's house, Luke 2.49. Secondly, we saw that the ministry of the Holy Spirit was at the baptism of Christ, which confirmed that Jesus was uh, the long-awaited Messiah when the Spirit of God descended upon him and stayed in the form of a dove. Thirdly, and finally, uh, from last week, we saw that uh, we saw the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the work of the life of Christ by driving him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And by withstanding the devil's temptation, Christ proved himself to be uh, the second Adam, the new representative head of all who put their faith in Christ. Tonight, we're going to uh, consider the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of Christ as it related to his empowering Christ for his redemptive ministry on this earth. Now, at the beginning of his public ministry, after John had baptized Jesus in the Jordan River, and if you will remember, it was during his baptism that the Holy Spirit came to rest on Jesus. It is the same Holy Spirit uh, who had come to rest on Christ that immediately drove him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And Luke's Gospel tells us that after his temptation in the wilderness, Luke chapter 4, verse 14, that Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. So when Jesus actually began his public ministry, when he actually began to go about preaching and teaching and healing and casting out demons, when, this, when the boots hit the ground, if I can say that, he, he did so in the power of the Holy Spirit. And what this means is that throughout his entire ministry, Jesus was completely dependent upon the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. And so let's begin by looking at the preaching and teaching of Jesus. The preaching and teaching of Jesus was completely empowered by the Holy Spirit, and this was uh, prophesied very clearly in the Old Testament, for example, in the book of of Isaiah, Isaiah uh, chapter 42, verses uh, 1, 2, and 3. This messianic prophecy is, is in fact quoted in the New Testament Gospel of Matthew chapter 12, verses 17 through 21, affirming that Jesus is the literal fulfillment of Isaiah's messianic prophecy. Now here's the prophecy from the New Testament as it is fulfilled in Christ. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not quench, until he brings justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles uh, will hope. This verse is speaking of the unbelief of Israel who will not listen to their Messiah, but states that the Gentiles will listen to the Messiah, and unlike national Israel, the Gentiles will believe in his name. Now, if you read through the New Testament, you realize that Jesus' ministry primarily focused on um, the Jewish people. But he did 
occasionally minister to the Gentiles. For example, in Matthew 15, verses 21 through 28, Jesus ministers to a Canaanite woman who hears him and believes in him. Another example comes from Luke chapter 7, first 10 verses of that chapter. Here Jesus heals the servant of a Roman centurion. And the Lord responds to this Gentile's faith by saying, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. Third example comes from Mark chapter 5 as Jesus uh, travels through a Gentile region and he goes to the Gerasenes and there he casts out a legion of demons from a poor Gentile sinner. And in John 4, Jesus uh, takes the gospel to a Samaritan woman in that city of Samaria. Now, Samaritans weren't pure Gentiles. Samaritans were... Uh, Gentile and, and Jew, they were kind of a, uh, what the Jews considered the Samaritans, a half-breed of sorts. Uh, Jesus goes to this Samaritan woman, and she believes in him, and then many Samaritans come and believe in him as well. So, Jesus did venture into Gentile territory and uh, fulfilled this prophecy given. But the primary fulfillment of God's redemptive ministry among the Gentiles wouldn't occur until after Jesus' ascension back to heaven and with the promised outpouring of his Spirit on the believers who then would take the gospel into the Gentile nations. Of course, we see the Apostle Paul being the primary one in the early period of the church taking the gospel as far as Rome. And then, of course, since then, uh, God's Holy Spirit has been moving in the body of Christ to continue to take the gospel to the Gentiles. All right. What we want to do now is to see the Holy Spirit's empowerment in Jesus' ministry among the Jews. You know, as we said, his, his preaching and teaching in that prophecy was spoken of, uh, that prophecy in Isaiah that was fulfilled in Matthew was a prophet, a prophet, prophecy of uh, the rejection of the Messiah by Israel and yet the Gentiles hearing. And in that prophecy it was promised that the Gentiles would hear and believe. And of course, again, that ministry uh, is continuing to this day. So, the Holy Spirit also empowered Jesus during his ministry among the Jews, which is where his short uh, life, uh, short ministry took place. In Luke chapter 4, verses 17 through 21, for example, Jesus comes to a Jewish village called Nazareth, and it's the Sabbath day. As was his custom, he goes into the synagogue, and he is given a scroll, and the scroll happens to be the scroll of Isaiah. And Jesus is going to read a messianic prophecy to those who have come to synagogue on that Sabbath day, and this is the prophecy. This is Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Notice that verse begins, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. The Gospel. Now after Reading this prophecy, Luke chapter 4, verses 20 and 21 tells us that Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And so very clearly, the Holy Spirit was empowering Jesus in his ministry among the Jews as he proclaimed the gospel to them. And this was all in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And so Jesus is preaching this sermon, preaching about the anointing of the Spirit that is upon him to preach the gospel to the poor, and the people are fixed on his words, and then he drops the bomb the scripture is fulfilled right now in me as you're hearing me say it. Spirit-powered 
empowered preaching. Now, when most people think of the Holy Spirit empowering uh, the preaching of the Word of God, they think that Holy Spirit empowered preaching brings great results. For example, we think that if biblical preaching in our churches is truly spirit-filled, spirit-empowered, then people are going to listen and they're going to respond in numbers. Now, while it is true, spirit-empowered preaching does bring results, the results are not often what we think that they should be in terms of people repenting and believing in mass. So often in the scripture and also in experience, the response to Holy Spirit empowered preaching is often anger and stubborn disbelief. People don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to hear the truth because it applies to them. For example, in the same account of Jesus preaching in the synagogue on a Sabbath day in the city of Nazareth, we pick up that story in Luke chapter 4, verses 28 and 29. Now, Jesus said some other things up to this point, but it's all in the context of his sermon and the fallout of that sermon. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of a hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. So here's an example of spirit-empowered preaching. And the result was not repentance and faith in Christ. Rather, it was anger and wrath and the desire to kill the messenger. So I think the lesson as far as spirit-empowered preaching is concerned is, is not to judge whether or not someone is preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit based on positive results. Because Jesus certainly was preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit and rather than a positive response, we find a negative response. God does not judge the success of those who preach his truth based on how many people respond positively to the message. Rather, the success of those who preach the word is based on their faithfulness to the word to proclaim what God has given them to proclaim, relying on the Holy Spirit to do so. If those who preach the word rightly handle the word, then in God's eyes, that person has successfully discharged their duties. Now, how people respond to the Holy Spirit, uh, Holy Spirit-empowered ministry of the Word, whether it's negative or positive, with believing faith or continued unbelief, is between them and God. The, the preacher is not responsible for the results, is what I'm trying to say. So don't be so quick to say that this person's preaching is not Spirit-empowered because you're not seeing a massive revival break out. In fact, sometimes God, uh, the, the works of God be, can be manifested in people not responding to the word that is preached. So by today's worldly church growth standards, the entire ministry and preaching ministry of Jesus Christ, uh, which was most definitely spirit-empowered, would be deemed a failure because most of the people who heard Christ rejected him and his teaching. All right. Um, I think that at this point we need to ask something that may be hanging kind of in your mind right now, a question that's kind of hanging in your mind. If Jesus was God incarnate, if Jesus was God himself in human flesh, the second person of the Holy Trinity, then why did Jesus need to be spirit-filled during his ministry on the earth? Why during his ministry, entire ministry, did the Lord Jesus Christ rely upon the Holy Spirit in order to fulfill all that God had called him to be and do during his ministry? Well, to understand uh, why Jesus needed the Holy Spirit in his life and ministry is to understand the nature of the incarnation of the Son of God himself. And this was something that we looked at in part 14 of this study. So you may want to go back and and watch that again. But at the incarnation of the Son of God, when he was conceived in the virgin womb of Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit, 
the human nature of Jesus was inseparably united to the divine nature of the second person of the Godhead, God the Son. Therefore, Jesus has two natures, one divine and one human. And these two natures are united together in the one person, Jesus. And if you'll remember from part 14, the technical term for this union of the two natures of Christ is called the hypostatic union. This hypostatic union describes, again, the unified essence or substance of the divine and human natures of Christ in his one person, so that the person of Christ is both God and man, completely God, 100%, completely human, 100%. And if you will recall, the reason that the divine uh, and eternal Son of God took upon himself the robes of humanity was in order to fulfill the Father's redemptive purposes for fallen humanity. I quoted Millard Erickson in his book, Introducing Christian Doctrines, and this is uh, in part 14. Let me read that for you again. If the redemption accomplished on the cross is to avail for humankind, it must be the work of human Jesus. But if it is to have infinite value necessary to atone for the sins of human beings in relation to an infinite and perfectly holy God, then it must be the work of the divine Christ as well. So when the Son of God took upon himself the robes of human flesh, Jesus did not stop being God. But in order for him to accomplish all that was necessary to redeem fallen humans, Jesus' humanity had to do that redemptive work. If Jesus is going to save humans, he must do it as a human. So what this meant for Jesus at his incarnation would... would was that he would experience all that humanity experiences. Hunger, thirst, pain, love, sadness, betrayal, the, the whole range of human emotion and experience. And of course the biggest one, a human experience of them all, temptation to sin. Remember Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Imagine that. Christ being tempted as we are by the, th the same things that we are tempted by. And yet he did not sin. How could Jesus in his humanity resist such an onslaught? By the power of the Holy Spirit. So to answer the question, why did Jesus need the Holy Spirit? We answer that in his humanity, Jesus was completely dependent upon the Holy Spirit, re relied totally on the Holy Spirit to fulfill his identity as humanity's second Adam, the replacement of the first Adam. So rather than appealing to his divine nature when he was tempted by the devil, Jesus relied on the Holy Spirit to resist temptation. From his humanity, Jesus relied on the Holy Spirit. I hope I'm making this clear uh, as I'm going through this, uh, I'm thinking ahead and uh, I'm losing my train of thought. So I hope I'm making this clear. So, if Christ was going to live a perfectly sinless life, then he would have to do so, humanly speaking. By not relying on his divinity to resist the temptation, but rather, from his humanity, relying on the Holy Spirit to resist the temptation. If Christ was going to die an atoning death for human sinners, then he would have to die as a man, a human, without relying on his divine nature to help him, but experiencing death in his humanity. Philippians 2, 5-8, through 8, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now Paul talks about what Christ did for us to redeem us. Christ Jesus, who, through though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, to be held on to. I'm going to use my divine nature to, to get me out of these uh, temptations and, and uh, to resist the devil and to do these miracles. No, verse 7 says he emptied himself. 
by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So in conclusion, this is, this is we're going to wrap it up very quickly here. In everything that Jesus did during his public ministry, he did so in reliance and dependence upon the Holy Spirit. Not by, if I can say this, cheating by appealing to his divine nature. Jesus truly, in his humanity, experienced the entire range of what it means to be human. And of course, that big one that is just out there is the temptation to sin. Jesus was tempted, and yet he did not sin. And so he has become the perfect sacrifice for us. So from his conception to his resurrection, the Holy Spirit was an active part in the ministry of the Lord. So rather than looking at each of those uh, instances in the scripture where we see the Holy Spirit uh, empowering Christ at the cross and raising Christ from the dead and uh, the power of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit through Christ, the Holy Spirit empowering Christ uh, to exercise demons, instead of looking at each of those and giving chapter and verse, we're going to stop uh, with this part of the study of the Holy Spirit, pneumatology, and next time we will look at the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. Again, I hope this was uh, clear <laughs> enough for you to understand. Uh, if not, it's all my fault, but uh, I pray that it is helpful to you. Father, we thank you for our time together in your word today. Open our minds and hearts for truth, God. Help us to uh, rely on the Holy Spirit in order to fight the good fight of faith that you've called us to, to be faithful stewards of the great gospel message. Father, forgive us of our many sins and help us to love you more. In Christ's name, amen. So next time, we will pick back up with the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer.